Hello, fight fans, and welcome to the Combat Challenge podcast. My guest is a heavyweight professional MMA athlete who has competed on numerous organizations such as UFC, M1 Challenge, Bellator, and is signed to KSW. His professional record is 19 wins with only six defeats, and he is on a seven-fight winning streak. He is ranked number 43 as the current best MMA heavyweight fighter in the world and is the current four times defending KSW heavyweight champion, Mr. Phil DeFries. Phil, thank you so much for joining us, my brother. Hey, thank you for having me. It's always a pleasure. Brother, it took a while to get us this uh, podcast, didn't it, my friend? I was getting annoyed, man. Oh, I'm always stuck in and diving, you know, trying to avoid the work. But, but we did it, man. Thank you so much. And am I right in thinking you're kind of in a hotel now and doing some training somewhere else and just getting ready? Yeah, I went down to Team Come On to uh, train with Tom Aspinall and uh, he's been a great help. You know, he's the man's a killer. You know, he's going all the way. Brother, I've got a fun fact for you. Do you know what the word KSW means? It means martial arts confrontation. And what, how do you say it in Polish? Oh, I'm no good at that. You'll have to tell me. Right, brother, I'm going to tell you, right? So it's confrontacja sztuk walki. Well, there we go. Confrontacja sztuk walki. Martial arts confrontation, brother. We're learning, we're learning, man. We're in the Polish community now, brother. We need to know. There we go. There we go. Now, your last fight, my brother, was on KSW 57 against Michał Kita. What did you know about Michal and what was your game plan? And then talk us through the fight itself. Uh, Michael's a, a very good boxer, you know, very basic, but very, very good. You know, he caught me with a lot of good punches. Uh, but my, my game plan is always to get you down, you know, do the takedown and ground and pound you out, which, which I managed to do, you know, so it was a successful night. Cool, man. And your next fight is on KSW 60, which takes place on the 24th of this month, where once again, you're the main event against Tomasz Narkun. Now, Tomasz challenged you two years ago for the heavyweight belt, where you've had the belts well, for years now. Tell me about that fight first with uh, Tomasz. How did that come about? What did you know about him? And talk us through the fight. Well, uh, Thomas had just beat the uh, rated middleweight champion, uh, Mohamed Karanov, who's quite famous in Poland, has got a good name for himself. And he thought he could maybe he'd step up and challenge me, you know, with the heavyweight belt. But uh, it didn't, didn't go too successfully for him, you know, and I, I managed to get the win. But he, he, is, a, he is a tough cookie, you know. But uh, th this time, I, I, I won the fight dominantly, 50-44. Uh, and this time, I'll get the finish, you know. And what was it about the last one that kind of gave you that dominant, unanimous decision? What was it that you did that nullified his game plan? Well, I'd start, I took him down at will the first round. I dropped him and just ground and pounded him 10 8 round. And uh, the other four rounds, I was uh, 10 9 and dominant uh, takedown to ground and pound full round. He must have been punched 500 times, poor, poor fella. No, brother. <laughs> So you're fighting Tomas again at uh, end of this month. How did that come about? Is it because he's been on a bit of a winning streak and he's kind of worked his way back onto contention? Yeah, well, we're both, we're both cleared out the division. We're both, like, he's beat every light heavyweight. Uh, I've beat all the heavyweights. We've signed another one now. But uh, there was no one left for us to fight, you know. So I think he uh, was crying upstairs trying to get the rematch and he's managed to get it. So did he fight Mohamed Khalidov at middleweight and then did he bump straight up to heavyweight? No, uh, Mohamed came up to light heavyweight to challenge him. Because uh, Khalidov is mainly a middleweight fighter, right? Most of his fights have been at middleweight. Yeah, yeah, he was a long way. The same thing, he was a long way and middleweight champion and there was uh, not many options for him. So he thought he'd challenge for the light heavyweight belt and Narcon stopped like a 10 fight winning streak when he beat him. They finished him with a triangle. And didn't he fight him twice? Yeah, yeah. Then Mamad wanted the rematch. He got it. Uh, just it was like a catchway about the next fight over three rounds. And then uh, Thomas won a decision. Oh, cool, man. So on this one, are you going to do anything different than what you did last time? Or do you think uh, Tomas is where he was last time and you just kind of keep to the same game plan? I'm just going to do the same thing as last time and uh, hopefully get the finish this time, you know. But uh, I, I'm, feel, I'm feeling better this time. You know, last time we went to the top team, 
But at this time, I've stayed at home and I've been going to Calvon with Tom Aspinall, who's an absolute killer. And I've been going to Scotland with uh, Paul Craig, who's like an absolute jiu-jitsu killer, you know. So, so there's been a, a more tailored fight camp, you know, and I feel great. So you, you're staying in a hotel now just to make sure you get your training in. So how long are you staying where you are now, you know, and training at Team Calvon? And then are you going to go anywhere else? Or is this where you're going to stay before you fight? I've been alternating. I've been doing a week here and a week and uh, well, like uh, three days here, and I, I'm doing. I did two weeks, two days last week, and two to two days next week at a uh, hit squad. You know, and I'm I'm spending a lot of time with my coach and work with my training partners back home. It's just to kind of vary the sparring up and get get those hard rounds in. Sure, brother. And now you're training all over to to find specific people to cater for Tomash and other people that you're going to compete against. But where is your like uh, your main gym? Where where are you like the homing pigeon for? Uh, my main gym is uh, Andrew Fisher's TFT in Seaham and Sunderland. It's, uh, it's a great gym. Fisher's Fisher's one of the best coaches about. You know, he's took me from uh, lags to riches. You know, so I'm very grateful. Brother, I've had him on the podcast, and he's one funny dude. Is that guy man? He's funny looking. Funny looking. <laughs> <laughs> no. Uh, one thing I want to bring up um, with you, my brother, is um, mental health. And if we can talk a little bit about that. Now, uh, I did a bit of research, and one of the things that I found out is, uh, unbeknown to you, from a young age, you kind of came up with uh, anxiety as mental health. And unbeknown to you, again, it prevented you. It caused, like, these uh, invisible ceilings and prevented you from developing as a fighter. If you can share that journey with us and... First of all, how it prevented you and how you are now, what's made the change? Well, I was kind of, I kind of had a hard time growing up in the house and at school. I was kind of bullied, like, in both areas, you know. And I kind of, like, uh, developed kind of a bit of agoraphobia and anxiety and just kind of, like, sheer terror of the world. But uh, I developed it at such a young age. I, uh, that was me. I didn't, I didn't know that this was normal. This this is how I, the only way I'd ever known it, you know. So when, when I was especially when I was in UFC, I was uh, going to be. I was I was terrified. I was like in the gym. I was kicking ass, you know, and having a good, like beating people up. These world class fighters. Then uh, when it was time to perform, I was I was totally I was bottling the fights. I totally bottled all the fights in the UFC, and uh, got uh, got got beat, you know. Then I kind of. Went back on the local scene and I got I got beat again, just off just having like uh, then I kind of kind of spiraled into kind of alcoholism and uh, like kind of drug addiction pretty much, and uh, I was I was at Glastonbury Festival and I, I was talking I was talking to people I was thinking I, I was like saying I was like saying like oh I could have been someone you know and I was thinking what are you, this is like classic thing you know you could have been someone and I thought you know some 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 it's not right with you you know like you need to kind of research it so I was like I, was, I think I, I think I googled like. Uh, irrational fear of everything and it was like anxiety which i'd heard of before and i was thinking anxiety like i've heard of that it can't be that it can't be that simple you know but uh, i made an appointment at the doctor and i like i'm so lucky like uh, i mean obviously the hard life and that and to get knocked out of ufc wasn't so lucky but I, I was so lucky the first course of treatment the doctor gave me totally cured my anxiety because uh People come up to us and go, oh, how did you beat your anxiety? And I go, oh, I, took, I, I took these pills. These pills did it. And uh, these, these other people have took these pills and it hasn't worked for them, you know. But I, I'm very, very lucky in that regard that this, this course of medication has changed my life. And when it comes to your fighting, because obviously there was the uh, disappointment with the mm -hmm. UK and what anxiety played with that. But then after you've been taking this medication, it seems like you're on a tra trajectory and you're on your way up, right? So, honestly, since the the the, the gut wrench and absolute terror of fighting with my anxiety, I don't I don't know why I did it. I didn't enjoy it at all. I hated the full thing. I hated weighing in. I, I hated being in the locker. I was terrified during the fight. And then uh, since I've been cured of that, I'm enjoying it. Like since it was like that before, now I have this superpower of like thinking. This is like so much better than it was before. I can I can enjoy this. That I, I, I can like it's it's amazing. You know, it's like superpower to have an anxiety to me now. And uh, and you can savor that moment and create those memories, right? Oh yes, yes. Like uh, like the like like 
like losing the fight now would be ten times better than winning a fight when I had the anxiety. It's like uh, it's not it's not just fight as well. Like my entire life is enriched, you know. Like uh, I'm a bit. I like l- luckily I've been cured of anxiety for as long as I've had children, and uh, like I, I like I, I, I obviously be a much better father. Like not terrified of everything. It, it was even outside of I was I was like basically totally insane, you know. I'd have to like. Uh, check the door like like 10 times to make sure I locked it. Then I would get down the street and I'll be like, oh, I left the oven on. Then uh, I was terrified of people stealing my dog. I got a camera in my bedroom to record my dog when I was out. So I thought people were going to steal it. And uh, I, I was like, I, I, I think this is this is not a normal way to behave, you know? Like, uh, and now I'm like borderline sane now, I think. <laughs> Looking back now, brother, the way you were then, uh, and uh, you know, and if you were to kind of put yourself back there, it must have been an awful existence, right? Oh, I was hot. I was hell, like hell. Just cut, like I couldn't have done this at this podcast. Say my my best friend in the whole world rang me on the phone. I would see it, and I would think, oh God, what's going on? Oh, what happened? They're like I would like I would think, oh, I've, I've upset somebody. Gangsters are going to come and get us. Oh, I broke the law. Or oh, this, that. But like then, then I wouldn't answer the phone. And I'd have to think for half an hour and I'd be thinking, he probably just wants you to go around on Saturday and have a cup of tea. So I'd be like, oh, yeah, yeah. So like, no bother, you know. But there's this mad, this mad, mad like, like constantly spying, thinking that the worst possible outcome is going to happen out of any situation, you know. So it sounds like the, the cup wasn't even uh, half empty. There was literally nothing in there. And any sort of experience that you had during the day, you'd think of worst case scenario, right? Oh, yeah, like every, everything I'll, I'll be terrified, you know, or why do this, or if you do, like, or, like extreme pessimism as well, you know, or uh, if you do this, this will happen, you know, blah, 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 you know, just, just, just worrying about everything. And like, like imagine when you, like, you're fighting and you think, oh, should I throw a jab? And you think, oh, nobody might count with the right hand. Or oh, should, should I do this? Or oh, what, what if he does that? Like, but like now I think I'm doing this stuff and you've got to watch out for me, you know. And it's crazy to think like that in a fight because you don't have time to be like kind of questioning stuff, right? Oh, not like you, you can't sit and guess for yourself. You start sitting guess for yourself. You're going, you're going to get beat, you know? And it, it kind of, it, what, also when I got the UFC and stuff, I would look at the bookmakers. And if, if I was the, the underdog, I would think, Oh my God! They, they, these under these these bookmakers know exactly who's going to win. Not their professionals, you know. So I'd like be like, oh, I'm going to lose, you know. And it just kind of the spirals from there. Now, the drugs and alcohol didn't help either, but it was kind of getting high and being drunk. When I was high and drunk, I wasn't anxious. I was happy. I, but like the next day, it was ten times worse. You know. Yeah, for sure. But I, uh, I assume at that time you just wanted that bit of escape from reality, right? Yeah, like I said, when I when I was drunk or high or whatever, I wasn't that anxious. I was kind of it relaxed me, you know. It felt 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 it was like a, a moment of like normality, which is like now I feel that all the time, you know. Just uh, I like obviously the more you more drink and drugs you do, the more anxious you get, you know. So it's just kind of like a spiraling, you know. And one of the podcasts you did, brother, on there, you you, you talked about how anxiety kind of prevented you from becoming a better fighter and learning more. How was that? What was all that about? I, I couldn't, uh, in my entire fight career, I haven't, uh, until I was cured of anxiety, I didn't gather any experience. Every single fight was like the first fight. I didn't get any more comfortable. I didn't uh, learn what worked. I didn't. I, I couldn't listen to my corner. I couldn't follow a game plan. I, I, like, it was like, uh, I'm like really only like seven fights. So, uh, since I started the win streak, it was as soon as I got the pills, that's when the win streak happened. I'm like, I, I'm still developing as a fighter who, who like can kind of, like I'm still like a seven fight fight. I really I didn't learn anything from those other other uh, 12 fights. But... And I'm all right thinking, brother, since you went to, you know, the, the, this organization, KSW, you haven't lost a fight there. No, I haven't lost it there. Then I won on the M1 and I won on Bellator before I got signed to KSW. And why uh, from Bellator to KSW, were you not signed with Bellator? Was it just like a one-fight contract? Yeah, it was a, it was a one-fight contract. So like a, like a, I took a fight on three weeks' notice for the Bellator Newcastle card. And I, after the fight, I was like, oh, uh, do you want to sign us? And they went, oh, we're not signing any more European talent right now. So I was like, oh, God. Then, uh, then, then KSW came along and it's, it's been the best thing ever. You know, I'm like, yeah, I'm so, so happy with KSW. It's just a, a great organisation. 
Well, and am I right? Scott Askham's part of KSW, isn't he? Yeah, yeah, Scott Askham have just uh, lost his belt to Mohamed Karadov, so hopefully he'll get his rematch uh, late, later in the year, you know. So would that be the trilogy between them? Yes, it will be the trilogy. So Scott won the first one, Mohamed won the second, then, and hopefully Scott wins the third one. I, th I think he will, you know. I think uh, you can't count that Mohamed off. He's incredibly explosive. But uh, I think Scott is the better fighter altogether. How old will Mohammed be now? He must be in his 40s now, brother, right? Yeah, I think he's 40 plus, you know. I, I, I think he's definitely over 40, you know. And uh, like, like the smaller you are, the, the, the worse age, a heavyweight could be 45, I think. I mean, I feel like a bit rickety now myself at 34. But those little fellas, they, they can't go as long as us, you know. But you, you see Anderson Silva, though, there's always exceptions. Yeah, for sure, brother, for sure, man. Well, thanks for sharing that, that journey with us, uh, the journey of uh, dealing with uh, anxiety. And because the reason I say that is people who may not be in the spotlight like yourself, uh, who may think, oh, they, those people are doing really well, you know, they have everything. But we're all humans, aren't we, brother? And we all suffer somehow, right? Oh, I mean, like, like I said, like uh, my life, like before, before I got this, the, the treatment and I was cured of anxiety. I still had four, I still had my friends, and it wasn't, it wasn't like I wasn't like living in a cage or anything. But the, the, ma the main thing is now I know I'm a better parent through not having anxiety. Like uh, I, I take the girls out, like so, say, say I would go to the shop, I, I couldn't have small talk with a shopkeeper. It would just be a terrifying, horrible uh, experience. Like now I'll go in and I say, oh, hello there, I see my neighbors when I'm leaving, I'm a chit chat with my neighbors, say bye bye. This was never possible, you know. Like, uh, like the girls would kind of learn that, just to kind of ignore things and don't don't engage with people. But like now, I'm like a happy person. I talk to all my neighbours. I go to the corner shop. I leave my friend at the corner shop. I always talk to them, you know. And that, that's how you should be, you know. Not like some person who's like terrified of saying hello to anybody. And that's crazy, like you said. It, you know, for you to be in that state of mind to even think about doing a podcast like this would would be unimaginable, right? Oh, I mean, uh, the UFC, we used to make you do these things, you know, but, uh, and I, I would do them, but it, it, I couldn't elaborate on a question. They would be like, kind of, you'd be like, oh, how, how, how are you preparing for this fight? And I would go, oh, I'm at the gym, training hard. I'd be like, then I'll, I'll probably get a bit cross. I like, I, I would really, like, I, I would like not understand the situation. And I, I would think, oh, is he, is he, and then I would then maybe you would like be like, hang on a minute, what's going on here? And I'd be like, well, what's your problem? You know what I mean? <laughs> Madness, absolute madness. But I'm, I'm happy now. No, that's yeah, the main thing. Sure, man, for sure. Well, I'm pleased that you're in such a cool place where a lot of people might see as normal, but you had to go through that craziness to end up where you are. And, and you know, you've still got time to reap those rewards, right? Yeah, I mean, it, it, it's normal for me. It's like heaven, you know, like normal life is heaven for me now. So I'm living the dream. <laughs> Well, brother, you were giving me anxiety from not answering my bloody messages, but I was getting annoyed. It's that, it's that, it's that, it's that, it's my, my fan page's inbox. You should have got my personal inbox, and I'd be much easier to read, you know? Brother, I was just a fan, you know what I mean? That's all I am. But, and I've known you for yeah. years, man. I'm like, <laughs> why is that Phil DeFries not answering my messages? <laughs> <laughs> oh, I'm, I'm terrible, you know? I never check it. I never check it. Oh, the, well, you got my number now. I use my personal Facebook. Now, brother, we need to talk about something uh, a little bit light in conversation than what we've just been talking about. <laughs> now, I'm going to mention a name to you, and then I want you to tell me the story because I've done some research. Yeah. And what I will say to you is an MMA fighter by the name of Brett Rogers. <laughs> so you tell me the story, how that came about, where you were with Brett beforehand, you know, which competition, and just talk us through this story, my brother. Uh, I, was, I, I was scheduled to fight Brett Rogers on IGF in Japan, you know, and uh, my manager at the time was like saying, uh, oh, this, this Brett, you know, he's like a crazy character, you know, where uh, like he's just like, he was friends with his manager and apparently on the, on the week of the fight, he tried to get in bed with his manager and stuff, you know, so it was like funny, you know, and uh, so anyway, I, 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 beat, I beat Rogers. And he's like, uh, well, the after party's all like, like moping about, you know, being all sad and that. Uh, my, my corner man, Dave, uh, felt a bit sorry for him. And he was like, oh, Dave, uh, Brett, uh, would you like to come out drinking with us? And I was all like, oh, no, no. But he ends up there coming out drinking with us. 
And uh, so we go to the, the party district, the district in Mapongi. He doesn't put his hand in his pocket all night. We're buying the drinks all night. I'm thinking, Jesus. I was like, well, we need, we need ditching, you know. Uh, so we're like, we're in the nightclub. Well, like, we've kind of ditched them, you know. And uh, these like Australian backpackers come up to me and they're like, um, hey, excuse me, is that, is that is that your your friend in the corner? He's uh, he's like, uh, he won't leave my friend alone. And he had this uh, poor Australian backpacker, a male backpacker. And he was like, kind of like groping him and like touching him and feeling him up and stuff. And I was like, look, I was like, that, that's, that's not my friend. We came in here with him. He's not, I don't know him, you know. I was like, tell security, you know, because uh, like he's nothing to do with us. I want nothing to do with this, you know. So anyway, um, later on, we're like, I'm trying to like stay out of the way. And he comes over, you know, and he starts like, uh, like trying to get my attention. He starts like, like touching, like slapping me dick like that, you know. And I was like thinking, oh, maybe he, maybe he thinks it's my leg, you know? So like, I'm like, what, Brett? And he just comes over and grabs my cock, cups, cups my cock, you know? And I was like, fucking hell. Like, I mean, people think, oh, why don't you hit him, you know? But like, yeah, you're in like the party, this is my pong, you don't want to get arrested. And they're like, he's like the big shock, you know, when somebody like sexually assaults you. So I'm like, I, I, I'll just start. And, I'll, and I got to my corner, man, Dave. I go, I go, Dave, I went, I went, Rogers. I just uh, felt my cock. I was like, we're going to have to get out of here. And he went, mate, you felt mine five minutes ago. I was, like, I was like, why didn't you tell me? You should have told me. I could have, I could have escaped, you know. So we left him, left him there, you know, see what happens. But he's been like, he went to jail on that for cock grabbing. And he went to jail for cock grabbing. And then he grabbed someone else's cock, you know. It's like uh, this thing, you know, sick, sick man, I think. It's craziness because I, then I looked into Brett Rogers and yeah, he did go to jail and then he kind of groped somebody in, in a, a lift as well and did some stuff there. It was just madness. Like, yeah, I mean, uh, he was telling me, well, the, the next fight, the next fight, he was fighting as well. And I was downstairs at breakfast, I was sitting off, you know, hoping up bump the Rogers. And he's come over and sat, sat down next to me and uh, do you mind if I sit here, Phil? And I was like, I was like, yeah, yeah, knock yourself out, mate. You know, didn't want to be rude. <laughs> but and that was after the incident in the nightclub. Yeah, this is the next fight, like three months later. You know, but he's a bad man. He is definitely, definitely a bad man. I mean, I think he's quite a disturbed man. You know, maybe he needs help or something. Possibly, brother, or maybe he just had designs on you, my friend. I don't know. You know what I mean? <laughs> well, he's telling us when when went for dinner. He went. Uh, he said, I think where he was training, maybe it's AKA or something, or maybe it's even top team. And then he said he would like go train, and then he went back, he cycled there, and they all hated him, you know, so the woman beat and stuff. He wasn't a really popular character. And uh, he went back to his bike, he used to cycle there, and they'd let his tires down and left a like, note on his bike saying, fuck off, vet, you know. <laughs> we would, I mean, which isn't very nice, but neither's attacking women or grabbing people's cops. For sure, brother, man, for sure. <laughs> Well, uh, thanks for sharing that story with us, man. I mean, we would have had anxiety if we didn't share that story. I'd be thinking, what if Rogers comes and gets me, you know? But, like, you need to get stuff out there, you know? People need to know that these people are dangerous, you know? Yeah, and like you said, if if, if Dave hadn't mentioned anything to you, you wouldn't have known that he tried it on with Dave as well, right? Yeah, yeah. Well, like, you should have told me that we could have escaped earlier than it could have saved me. <laughs> no, brother. Uh, obviously, we know you from who you are now and how well you're doing in competitions, but I don't really know your martial arts journey. Could you tell us from a young age what sort of sports you got into and lead us down that martial arts journey, if you can? I didn't uh, start uh, any sort of martial arts till I was 14. I started the BJJ, and then then I like, kind of didn't like it and went back when I was 16, you know, so it kind of didn't start when I was 16. I kind of... What well, started was watching the early UFCs, like uh, Boyce Gracie, like beat everybody up in the gi. So I thought, oh, I'll do this BJJ, you know. So I joined the club there. Then uh, kind of uh, one of us taking a step forward with the MMA, you know, and start like, uh, then I kind of had like a full line. My first coach was like a bad apple, you know, like a bad apple, bad egg, whatever, you know, just invested in the cash and stuff. And uh, that didn't help with the anxiety and stuff. Then I, then I went to UFC, talking about a few gyms. And then, not until like well, I think it was maybe 30 I didn't go to Fisher who was like an actual coach who kind of cared about us like uh, didn't want a penny off us one of the offered his pad work I was like uh, when, when Fisher took me on I was like, uh, like I was like I was pretty much obese fat uh, depressed having a, having a nightmare you know and he's kind of like changed all that for me you know so it's like like uh, if you start out martial arts you know like if you find a coach you think he's a turd 
he may very well be, you know. Yeah, for sure, man. Now, not mentioning the name of the coach that you said was a bit of a bad egg, but what was it? Was it because that coach was more into the finance rather than teaching you or what? Yeah, entirely every single decision was made depending on how much money you can make. Uh, it wasn't about your progression, about your happiness, about your martial arts journey. It was entirely about the dotted line, how much cash he could make, you know. And it's uh, it's terrible, you know, like... Uh, like like Fisher, like 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 now, I like he, he, he wants to do what's best for me, you know. Like he does what what's best for his membership. He like says, oh, go, I, I'll go away, I'll go train to Calbon, I'll go uh, to to top team, I'll go all over, you know, to make myself a better martial artist. He, he doesn't go, uh, Phil, why why are you training at my my sessions five times a week? Like it's you, you've got you've got to let, let people build themselves, you know, make decisions that are best for them, you know. Because I'm the one getting the brain damage. I'm the one who's fighting. I'm the one who's on a time limit for how long my career is. And I, I need to make as much money for my family and stuff, you know? For sure. And like I alluded to earlier on, where, uh, you know, you have to have like, um, uh, be a bit of a homing pigeon and have your own base, which is, you know, you've got um, uh, the fish tank place there. But at the same time, fish is confident enough in saying, look, go where you need to go to sharpen your tools. And I'm always yeah. here as a safety net, which is such a cool feeling to have, right? Oh, I mean, I'm, 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 I'm like this, like when I have a fight, the six weeks beforehand when I'll travel, the rest of the time I'm there, Fisher makes my game plan. Fisher tells me what to drill, what to do. I've got a great squad there. I've got Mick Park, who's a great amateur. Uh, but you, you need variety and you need uh, putting on your toes a bit when it's come to sparring, you know, and, uh, and you, you need specifics as well. So like, like with Fisher, it's entirely about me doing the best I can as a martial artist. And uh, like at the moment, at the moment, kind of making as much money as possible before I've got to retire, you know. And he, you know, he didn't didn't want a penny for it, you know. I've got a forced cash. I'm I'm earning okay. I'm earning the best I've ever had in my career. I've just left my job, and uh, I've got a forced cash in his hand. You know, he's like he doesn't want it, you know. But like, I have to give him, it, you know, I have to give him. It. Well, that's cool because that's you, your way of saying, even though he doesn't want it, you feel like you want to give it to him because he has contributed positively in your life, right? Oh, if it wasn't for Fisher, I would like, uh, I wouldn't know where I would be. You know, I'll be uh, like when I was still had the anxiety and still depressed, he kind of, and I was like kind of half give up on the dream, you no know, half give up on us. He said, Come and come and like, I mean, maybe we should go way back. We were students in the same classes, bloody 15 years ago or something, maybe it's even longer. So when we were friends, first and foremost, they would come and come and train with me. I won't charge you a penny. Um, you can, you, I'll give you pads and stuff, and uh. Even even when, like when I had when I was first, I went back on the local scene to kind of build my reputation up, get paid like five six hundred pound. He didn't want a penny of it, you know. It's only now that I'm earning decent money that like I he hasn't even mentioned it, but like like now he's start, he's starting to reap the rewards. But he didn't he didn't want anything, didn't want anything like when I was when I was barely earning anything, you know. So I'm, I'm happy to give him it, you know. And and that's good for you because you're saying, look, you know, you didn't want it then. But now I'm earning, and this is my way of saying thanks. So it's really cool that you're doing, man. That's that's really cool. Yeah, I mean, I mean like uh, he, he's, a, he's a top bloke. He is a, he's a top bloke, you know. It reminds me a little bit of uh, Danny Mitchell, you know, from AVT, where he has, oh yeah, and they go all over to do the training, but they come back there, and there is that loyalty. And Danny's always said to people, look, go train wherever you got to train, and he's got that base, which is similar to what Fish has been with you. Yeah, like fish is always there for us. You know, like I said, he makes we do me and fish do loads of work. We're getting to do five and every week. We do pads twice a week. Like even like this week, I'll still go to two or three classes, even though I'm down. Uh, Cal Bond training, you know. So that is my home gym. That's where I spend nearly all the time. But there's not a lot of heavyweights in the world, you know. So if there's a good one, you might as well go and train with them. And like I said, uh, Paul Craig in Scotland and this Tom Aspinall in in Cal Bond are like next level killers, you know. For sure, brother. And Paul Craig, he's in the UFC, and it's Tom as well. Yeah, Tom's just beaten Andre Olofsky. He's like ranked 14th in the world. He nicked my number one spot with that fight, actually, little bugger. <laughs> nicked my number one UK spot, so he's number one in the UK now. But I tell you what, he's a killer, and he's, he's a great guy. You know, no, be no better guy to steal your number one spot than Tom. Sure, <laughs> you also mentioned uh, Mick Parkin. He's a big dude, and is he from a striking background? Yeah, he's uh, great, but he, he can do everything, you know, and he's very willing to learn, and he's a, he's a big guy, you know, he's kind of my main training partner at TFT now, he, he's only been there 
little wine. He came from the same old culture I came from, you know, so we've got a lot in common, you know, and uh, he, oh, he's, he's great, you know, like a proper team player. I'm taking him to pole up to do my corner, you know, he's, he's, a, he's, a, he's a solid good guy, you know. For sure, brilliant. He's fighting on Saturday as well, fighting on uh, Cage Steel. Oh, is it? Oh, yeah, yeah. So I was speaking to Dom Gibbs about that, and I think they've got the, the pay-per-view going on, which is really cool. I think it's only like a tenner for the, the pay-per-view, so it'd be worthwhile. Uh, oh, it's great it. that the, the block fights, he's been out of action. He's a, he wants to be active, you know, he's a, young, he's a young martial artist. He wants to get recognition, get some experience. And it's just been, has been possible over the last year, you know, so I'm, I'm glad he's finally got a match. And he, he's got the frame for a heavyweight, right? Because he's really broad in the shoulders, right? Yeah, he's like the same the same build as me, you know. He's like proper proper heavy. Sometimes you get a lot of heavyweights kind of like juicing up and like kind of lifting weights and like not having the right sort of build to fight. Whereas he's like big and thick set and he's proportionate to like the way he should be to his body. For sure, brother. Now the other thing I need to ask you, my friend, and I ask this from a, a lot of people is what fight routine do you have? So on fight day, after you've done the weigh-ins the day before, what kind of routine do you have uh, when you get into the venue, uh, in the changing room, just before you come out into the arena? Oh, a fight day, I barely eat, I have a little breakfast, and I sleep all day. Somehow like, the, like a sleepy monster comes and makes me sleepy all day, I'll sleep. I'll sleep in, I'll sleep late o'clock, then I'll have a nap, like 10 o'clock. Then I'll, 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 I don't want to go to the venue until as late as possible. I think I'll, I'll, I'll say, oh, no, we, we need you at three, I'll go. I'll come at five, and I'll be like kind of arguing with us, you know. So I'll stay in bed all day. I'll have a little nibble, like uh, some bananas and stuff, and I'll go to the venue, lie down, head over, head over. If you've got obligations, you know, you've got to speak to people and stuff, then I'm kind of like lying down. Then Fisher will go, look, Phil, you better start moving. You know, you're going you're gonna to be fighting in 40 minutes. <laughs> so I do uh, light stretches. I like a uh, little stretch out. Don't do a big warm-up, kind of like a uh, stretch, few shoots, few punches. I'm good to go, you know. They're, they're, when, when I'm doing the walk, like, like I said, the walk was a thing of terror. It was like walking the Green Mile, one of the anxiety. Now I'm like, oh my God, this is amazing. I'm slapping everyone's hand, the camera's on us, my song's on. I'm like, I'm like, oh, this is all, this is all for me, you know. This is a great experience to get behind it. So then you go in there, then, then, then when you fight, you kind of, it's all, it's all kind of programming, you know. We kind of, just when you're in there, you just got to fight, you know. So that's your, your, you know, your, your fight routine uh, after you, you know, you've, you've had your treatment, your medication, you've got your anxiety uh, in check. Before that, when you were suffering with anxiety, what was the difference then with your fight routine? Uh, to, the, the pre-routine was very similar. That's maybe where I've kept it, you know, kind of like, I, I would just kind of bury my head in the pillow and kind of, I would be hiding from the world, you know, maybe that's why I'm still, maybe that's why I'm still so sleepy. But uh like like the walk to the venue was terror the uh or the weight the weight was the or it was, it was like it was, like now I, I can't wait i want to get out there and do this amazing experience then it was like it was like walking the green mile you know this horrible thing is gonna happen now you know so and it's all it's all mental you know like it's gonna and every fight i enjoy it more so this time it'll be even better it's crazy i can picture you walking i can hear that voice in Dead man walking, dead man walking. Well, if you look, if you look at my walkouts for UFC, you're seeing a person who who doesn't want to be there. He hates it. I hate every minute of it. Oh God! Like I said, I don't, I don't even know why I did it. I don't know why I did it. Did this job that I hated so much. I don't know. I think kind of stubbornness, you know. And I'm still stubborn now. Well, uh, I'm pleased you're enjoying it now, brother, because I think I saw one of your walkouts recently and you're coming out and your mouth is moving and you're saying stuff. I can't hear what you're saying and you've got the, the rash guard on and you're proper like yeah. saving in the moment, right? All I said, like, uh, it was James Will Heaven said, like, he used to say, uh, enjoy it, you know, go out there, enjoy it, slap the, the crowd's hands, feel the lights, you know, it's all about you, you know. I mean, it sounds like an egomaniac, but it, it's working for me, you know, and I'm enjoying it. Yeah, for sure, man. Now, brother, you've had loads of fights. Now, out of all those fights, is there any that stick in your mind that are quite rewarding? There might have been some sort of adversity, some sort of wake up, some injury that you have come back from. Is there any fight that you could share with us that sticks in your mind? And the, the fight which meant the most to me was uh, winning the, uh, the title for KSW of Andershack. So I kind of got that. I was, I was 
kind of brought in for kind of like a sacrificial lamb for Andrashak. He was on like a five fight winning streak, knocking everybody out. I was four to one underdog. And uh, I mean, I, I wasn't anxious, but I, I was very, very quite nervous and scared in the change rooms. I was actually watching, I actually watched Rocky in the changing room before I went out to fight, you know. I was saying, oh, what are you watching? I was like, Rocky. I was like laughing, Rocky. But I, I watched Rocky to kind of like, to get me still in there, you know, and then I won that fight, and that's when I, I realized, like Phil, you you are one of the best in the world. You can you can beat anyone in your day, you know. This you can do this. You can make a living, and you can enjoy this, you know. Like that that was the I didn't have the anxiety anymore, but I, that's when it sparked my self belief. You know, I kind of got like double serious after that. Well, that self belief uh, I stayed with you, brother, because since then four times. The, the top of the food chain have come and tried to get that belt off you and you've just continued enjoying that experience, right? Yeah, every every, uh, every fight I'm, I'm getting better, you know, like I'm investing in my camp more, I'm investing in my nutrition now, like I'm, I'm, I'm paying to go away, I'm spent like, I mean, these hotels now, they all add up, you know, I travel and whatnot. And, uh, but like, it's just something, you know, I, 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 I'm putting everything into winning these fights now, you know, uh, and I keep winning and I'm going to keep winning even more. For sure, brother. Now, you had loads of fights, my friend, and uh, you're doing really well. You're competing on the premiership level. If there's athletes who have taken the jump from amateur, they've started their professional career, from your knowledge and experience, what advice would you cascade down to them? I mean, the, the first bit of advice is, is surround yourself with people who actually care about you and make sure you're not like... Uh, handed all this loyalty over to somebody who doesn't deserve, you know, I wasted years of my life in a gym that was just using me, you know, I didn't, uh, I didn't develop this martial artist at all, I was kind of a waste of years and years and years, so, you know, find, find, a, find a team who, who the, 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 is a guy you can trust, who can get behind, who's also good at martial arts, you know, and, uh, so, like the same sort of things, you know, you might have a manager who's a turd, there might be another turd somewhere else, you know, your best mate might be a turd, your last fight be dragging, dragging you down, you know. Surround yourself with good people. Uh, work hard as you can in the gym. And uh, enjoy yourself, you know. It's like life's about having fun, you know. If I wasn't there, like, I, don't, like, I, don't know, I don't know why I did it. It was madness. I don't know why I did it. I hated it. But uh, now, it, it, uh, fight is a good life, you know. It's put me in a new house. It's, uh, I've left my job, you know. I've made some nice investments. And uh, I'm loving it, you know. Like, it's, all, it's all paying off now, all those years I heard. Brother Phil, thank you so much for sharing your knowledge and experience and also sharing, you know, the, the, the negative and the downside of your martial arts career and your life in general. And hopefully you'll come on board and you'll answer my message straight away when, uh, not if, but when you win and we, we get on the next podcast, my brother. Definitely. It's been my pleasure. I won't miss it for the world.